I'd like to call up Chelsea Blackburn Cohen, who's SARS membership senior program officer, um, to moderate our panel. So please, um, Chelsea will have a bunch of questions to ask the panelists, but there will be a portion at the end where you all can ask questions. So please think of questions you want to ask. These are human rights professionals who have a lot of experience on advocating on the Hill and in all other venues. So this is your chance to really ask the experts. Okay, thanks Chelsea. Okay, uh, as Alex said, my name is Chelsea Blackburn Cohen, um, and I'm really excited to be here and have the opportunity both to hear from the exceptional panelists I'm about to introduce, uh, as well as to witness the inspiring advocacy efforts of all the students in this room, um, which would not also be possible without the support and leadership of their faculty members. Um, so I wanna take uh, this opportunity to extend my gratitude to them as well. Um, as we all know, these efforts have become increasingly necessary in the defense of the right to think, question, and share ideas that matter greatly to our society. So I'd like to start by introducing each of our panelists. Um, and I guess when I introduce them, they'll come on in. <laughs> so um, Mr. Thomas Melia is Washington Director at PEN America. Um, yeah, come on. <laughs> So Thomas is Washington Director at PEN America, and prior to joining PEN, uh, he served in the Obama administration as Deputy Secretary of State for Democracy, Human Rights, and Labor, uh, responsible for Europe and Eurasia, South and Central Asia, and the Middle East, and as Assistant Administrator for Europe and Eurasia in the U.S. Agency for International Development, or USAID, uh, until January 2017. We're really grateful to have you here with us, Thomas. Uh, next, I will introduce Miss Rosie Berman, uh, who is Rosie with us? Everyone should just come out and join me. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. You can all come out. You can all come out. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so now that we have the full panel here, when I introduce you each, if you just want to give a little wave so everyone knows who is who. Uh, but Ms. Rosie Berman is the Bipartisan Staff Associate at the Tom Lantos Human Rights Commission, where she manages the Defending Freedoms Project, which allows members of Congress to advocate for prisoners of conscience around the world, uh, and helps prepare congressional hearings, briefings, and other events. Before she worked for the TLHRC, she interned at the Office of Representative Self Moulton and first stand the student-led movement to end mass atrocities. She earned her bachelor's degree in political science with a concentration of Holocaust and genocide studies from Clark University in 2016. Thank you for being with us today, Rosie. Thank you for having me. <laughs> and just as a, just as a side for all of you here, our microphones are actually not projecting to the audience, but they are projecting in terms of our live stream, so just continue to speak in them as you are. Um, Ms. Maya al Sadani is the Legal and Judicial Director with the Tahir Institute for Middle East Policy. She has previously worked at the International Center for Not-for-Profit Law, Robert F. Kennedy Human Rights, and the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace, among other organizations. Ms. al Sadani's published work has covered legal and constitutional issues in Egypt, human rights issues in Syria, transitional justice in the Middle East, and the split between Sudan and South Sudan. It's a pleasure to have you here, Mai. And then on beha uh, behalf of um, Omar Kanat, uh, who could not be here today, we have uh, Nicole Morgret and Zubaira uh, Shamsuddin, is that right? Yes. Okay, right. perfect. Um, so I'll introduce Nicole first. Um, Nicole is the project coordinator for the Uyghur Human Rights Project, uh, which is a research-based human rights advocacy organization. Um, Nicole has extensive experience living overseas in a background that includes work on political campaigns and NGOs and as a teacher. Uh, before joining U, um, UHRP, she spent four years in China, including several, uh, several years in Nanjing, where she earned her master's degree from the Hopkins Nanjing Center. 
And then uh, Ms. Zubaira Shamsuddin is the Chinese Outreach Coordinator at the Uyghur Human Rights Project. She has been campaigning for the human rights and political freedom of Uyghur people since the late 1980s. Before, jo uh, before joining UHRP, uh, Ms. Shamsuddin worked as information officer, researcher, and translator at the International Uyghur Human Rights and Democracy Foundation. She has worked in multicultural education and community liaison for nonprofit, academic, and government organizations in Australia and in the US for over two decades. Thank you both for being here on behalf of Mr. Kanat. Thank you. Thank you. So as you all know, this panel here is intended to highlight the ways in which our panelists have engaged uh, government officials in advocacy and in so doing provide insight and advice for students to take with them tomorrow as you go to Capitol Hill. Uh, as such, I also want to emphasize that the questions guiding this discussion today uh, largely come from the students themselves. Uh, we'll also reserve time at the end for a Q&A session uh, as well. Before we begin, I'd also like to take the opportunity to provide a quick review of the cases that the students have been working on, um, on behalf of whose advocacy activities bring us all here together today. So uh, the cases include the case of Dr. Hatun Al-Fasi, a scholar of women's history and prominent women's rights activist imprisoned in Saudi Arabia since June 2018. Mr. Shiwei Wang, a PhD student researching the Qajar dynasty imprisoned in Iran for over two years. Dr. Ahmad Reza Dajali, scholar of disaster medicine imprisoned in Iran for over two years. Dr. Nassim bin Gaith, prominent economist imprisoned in the United Arab Emirates for over three years. Dr. Gian Sababa, scholar of English literature and human rights activist imprisoned for two years. And then of course the case of the Uyghur scholars who the students have been highlighting, particularly the cases of Dr. Abdul Qadir Jalaladin, prominent academic and writer imprisoned for over one year. Uh, Dr. Rahil Duat, scholar of Uyghur uh, studies imprisoned for over one year. And of course Ilium Toti, an economics professor imprisoned for three and a half years. Thank you for all the work you've all been doing on these cases. So I'll begin if you could each just tell me a little bit about your current position at the organizations you're representing today, uh, and if you can tell us how your organization conducts advocacy on the Hill. If you want to start. Mm -hmm. Hi, and thanks for inviting me to join you today. Um, I think I've probably got as much experience as everybody else here put together, because I'm the old one on the panel. Um, but I happen to have been at NYU in New York City yesterday, uh, meeting with uh, a Saudi woman researcher who is uh, there for a year uh, doing work on women's rights in uh, Saudi Arabia and the Gulf region and talking about uh, Hatun Al-Fasi among other cases uh, of imprisoned uh, writers and scholars. So um, I feel like I'm spending a lot of time with NYU this week. Um, I have been on both sides of the table over the years. I worked on Capitol Hill in my youth. Um, for a New York Senator, Daniel Patrick Moynihan, who uh, was famous in some circles for being an advocate for human rights uh, back in the 1970s and 1980s uh, when, when I knew him and worked with him. Uh, since then, I've worked at the State Department and at USAID in the US government, so I've been on the receiving side of people coming in and saying, you should do more about this or that, uh, this person or this case or this uh, unjust law or this terrible situation. And in particularly in my job at the State Department when I was in the Bureau for Democracy and Human Rights and Labor, uh, it was my job to go out and engage those other countries and try to push the dial a little bit and, and try to persuade them uh, that they would be more successful as countries if they were less repressive against their own citizens. Um, sometimes that's a, an easy argument to make and sometimes it's very hard. Sometimes government officials think that the only problem is people complaining about their governance. Uh, saying that they're not doing enough or not governing inclusively enough. So um, so I've been at the point of the spear in going to various parts of the world to do those kinds of diplomatic dialogues. Um, and then, of course, at USAID and other places, we provide financial support to local advocates, to human rights watchdog groups, to civil society groups who are trying to make similar cases to their own governments and to their publics. So I have uh, seen various parts of this, uh, this equation. Uh, more of my career to date so far has been on the advocacy side working for non-governmental organizations, whether it was Freedom House or uh, National Democratic Institute or where I work now currently at Penn International. So Penn, as in mightier than the sword, uh, is a writer's organization and we defend freedom of expression and freedom to write. Uh, and one of the things that we do each year 
is to pick a signature case of an imprisoned writer, and that person is given the Freedom to Write Award. The awardee is never present at our event because that person is in prison somewhere in the world. Uh, last May, we do this every May, last May we gave this award to the two Reuters journalists uh, who are imprisoned in Myanmar for their accurate reporting on atrocities committed against the Rohingya minority there. The previous year we gave it to Oleg Sentsov, who is a Ukrainian writer and filmmaker, who is currently serving a 20-year sentence for terrorism in a, Russia's northernmost prison for his nonviolent advocacy on behalf of Crimea against the Russian occupation and takeover in 2014. And um, um, in May, we will announce uh, a new uh, awardee and a new project that we will work on trying to get some other people uh, out of their imprisonment, usually writers of different kinds, because that's what our mandate is. So um, you guys focus on scholars at risk. We focus on artists at risk. In fact, we have a specific team in our organization in New York that is dedicated to working with scholars in difficult places. And just on Monday this week, we put out a report that I'll give to you guys. You can send around to the whole, whole group uh, a link to a report that we published on Monday about uh, a Cuban uh, government decree, called Decree 349, which heightens the uh, bureaucratic and repressive apparatus around all kinds of artistic expression in Cuba. So even though the country has in some ways been opening up to the world in recent years, they uh, have just articulated a whole new, very um, an atavistic, uh, communist kind of uh, framework for controlling what artists may produce and who may uh, see their work, whether it's uh, sculpture, painting, poetry, uh, novels. So we're active in a number of ways. And one of the reasons I give you all those postcards is that in our advocacy, we want people that I meet or that my colleagues meet to always go away with something that will remind them of what we're doing. So you'll see in these postcards, uh, some of them are about Oleg Sentsov's case. You'll see there's a one that's a postcard of a photograph of a big black limousine. Well, that's the only picture I think that exists of Vladimir Putin and me in the same photograph. <laughs> He's in the limo, uh, and that's at Helsinki last July when he was on his way to meet with President Putin uh, for their uh, summit. Um, and I am standing on the other s in the background, there's a banner that says, Free Oleg Sentsov, the Ukrainian filmmaker. Uh, and we were there participating in several uh, ev human rights events in Helsinki around that summit meeting. And so I would speak at different rallies and to the media. And then we happened to be right along the, s the street that the presidential limos were coming down. So we unfurled our banner so that Vladimir Putin would see that we were advocating for Oleg Sentsov right there. And so when we posted that photo on our website and sent it around, we said, Putin gets the message. And I think he did, because the limousine was going very slowly, like 10 miles an hour as he came down. And when he came to where our sign was, the car sped up. <laughs> and, he ran, and he zoomed down to where he was going to meet with President uh, Trump. So sometimes we do just visibility things, whether it's standing out in a public place with a big banner. Sometimes it's with these postcards to have people carry them around in their pockets or their briefcases or their, their handbags. Um, uh, but we want visibility. We want people to be reminded of the cases of the people we're trying to liberate. And uh, uh, I won't go on much longer at this point other than to say that if people would come in to see me in the State Department and they gave me something that would sit on my desk and remind me of the conversation we'd had, um, I was more likely to remember it. Maybe do something about it the next day than if it's just an interesting conversation and we shake hands and they walk away. So visibility, handing over something. It could be a report. could be a biography of somebody that's, uh, whose case you're following. Could be some, it could be an article that you or your colleagues have written or someone else has written. I published an article about Ilham Todi, for instance, uh, the Uyghur uh, professor who's been in prison for several years. Uh, and, we, and I look for ways to publish articles as well for that visibility and that impact uh, on people. The last thing I'll say in terms of uh, advice for your advocacy is uh, be clear on what you're asking for. Think about who you're meeting with and whether it's the same request that you would make to a member of Congress or to a State Department official or to a journalist. There may be different things that they can do to help you advance the case of the scholar that you're trying to advocate for. So be clear that you've thought through 
what that person or that organization can do or ought to do, and then be very clear in asking them to do it. So that's my guidance for the moment. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Thank you again for having me. It's a pleasure to be here again. I was here last year, and it's a very interesting audience. So happy to join you. Um, as a human rights lawyer, I have done a lot of different types of advocacy, whether it's advocacy in the form of writing articles, whether it's in the form of submitting legal complaints, whether it's in the form of going in and doing the traditional uh, conversations with State Department or the White House or whatever it may be in order to raise attention to a particular case. Um, so I've done the types of advocacy where maybe attention is on a specific individual, much like what you're doing here today, but I've also done advocacy that focuses on the broader theme. Maybe takes an individual or a group of individuals in order to talk about that broader issue or the broader trend that we're seeing in a particular country or region. And that's sort of the capacity that I'm in today. I'm representing the Tahrir Institute for Middle East Policy, which is a policy institute that was established after the revolutions in Egypt and across the Middle East to amplify the demands of people on the ground and to really bring to light the stories and the remarkable vision of the people who had taken to the street to demand their constitutionally enshrined rights, their internationally guaranteed rights. Um, at the Tahrir Institute, we do advocacy in a lot of different forms, but first off, we do our own research and knowledge production so that we understand the trends that are going on. So it may be the production of simple reports and explainers that talk about academic freedom in a particular country or that talk about a law that governs academic freedom. Maybe it's a media law that constrains the ability of an individual to write on Facebook or even to do their own individual research. Maybe it's more systematic research where we're looking at overall trends. So that form of <coughs> advocacy. And then there's also the engagement with Capitol Hill, with the White House, with the EU, at times with the UN or the regional mechanisms, where we're taking the information that maybe we've collected and produced in-house and then talking about why it's so important and tying it back to the individuals that the organization was created in the first place to talk about. And then finally, also capacity building. While we get to do this work here in DC, one of the most important things to us is to incorporate people who are actually living in the region into the advocacy to make sure their demands are constantly represented into our modus operandi is very much the idea that the reason we're here and the reason we're telling these stories is because brave people took to the streets and amplified these demands and made these calls. So most important thing we can do is to be in touch with those people regularly to provide them with opportunities to come to DC and the US and do their own advocacy alongside us, to give them platforms in order to amplify the remarkable work that they're doing. Um, so that's sort of the work that we do and it takes a lot of different forms. Um, but I'll stop there just so we uh, and maybe jump into what we do a little bit later. That's wonderful. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. It's great to be here with all of you today. My name is Rosie Berman, and I am the bipartisan staff associate for the Tom Lantos Human Rights Commission in the U.S. House of Representatives. Thank you, Scholars at Risk, for inviting me. It's a huge honor to be here with everyone. And before I begin, I'd just like to make clear that I am speaking from my own experiences. I am not speaking on behalf of the commission. The Tom Lantos Human Rights Commission was established in 2008 in the name of Representative Tom Lantos, who was a Democrat of California. He was the only Holocaust survivor to serve in Congress. He was born in Budapest, Hungary, and was saved by Raoul Wallenberg who unfortunately vanished later into the Soviet gulag. And throughout his congressional career, Representative Lantos was a fierce advocate for human rights, and he founded our predecessor organization, the Congressional Human Rights Caucus. A caucus is a less formal organization of members of Congress who are interested in a certain issue. And we have a counterpart in the Senate, the Senate Human Rights Caucus. We were established as a commission in Mr. Lantos's name in 2008, and the Senate Human Rights Caucus is working to be established as the John McCain Senate Human Rights Commission. And I think it's great because then we'll have true bipartisan representation, where Mr. McCain was a Republican, Mr. Lantos was a Democrat, and we'll have these human rights commissions 
named for both Republicans and Democrats to show a bipartisan commitment to human rights in the legislative branch. And the commission is chaired by a Democratic and a Republican co-chair. Our Democratic co-chair is Representative Jim McGovern of Worcester, Massachusetts. He represents the district where I went to college at Clark University. Anyone here from Massachusetts? Yeah. <laughs> and a Republican co-chair for the 116th Congress is to be announced, we'll hear shortly. Our Republican co-chair for the 115th Congress was Representative Randy Hultgren of Illinois. The TLHRC, we usually call it by the initials because Tom Lanter's Human Rights Commission is a really long name. The TLHRC's mission is to promote, defend, and advocate for internationally recognized human rights norms as enshrined in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. And we're advocating in a nonpartisan manner, both within and outside Congress. Our co-chairs have equal power no matter who controls the House, which makes it different than a traditional committee which has a chair and a ranking member based on who controls the House. And our co-chairs work closely together, as I was saying, with the two commissions being named after a Democrat and a Republican, bipartisanship is vital to our work. What the commission actually does is we host hearings and briefings and events, both for the public and for interested congressional staff. Our co-chairs send letters to the executive branch, such as the White House to state, to sometimes the Department of Defense or USAID, and also to foreign governments. Something we also do that many of you may be familiar with is we sponsor the Defending Freedoms Project, which allows members of Congress to advocate for prisoners of conscience around the world. We partner with Scholars at Risk on this project in addition to Amnesty International, U.S. Commission on International Religious Freedom, Freedom House, Freedom Now, and Reporters Without Borders. The TLHRC is primarily an educative body within the Congress, so if you're a member of Congress who's interested in integrating human rights into your foreign policy, you come to us. And unlike many of the groups represented on this panel, we are who you come to with your advocacy asks. So we get a slightly different perspective than advocates get. Thank you. Thank you for having me here today. Um, I'm, I am not very prepared, but um, what I hear from my other co-chairs, I mean, the co-panelists, it's everything is very familiar to me. Um, as a being, I'm a Uyghur uh, human rights activist as well as um, uh, just a Uyghur. Um, my position at the Vigor Human Rights Project is China's Outreach Coordinator. Um, probably uh, my colleague Nicole will talk about more about advocacy of what we do. And um, as a China's Outreach Coordinator, my position is just reaching out to Chinese people. However, in terms of advocacy, what I have done in my life is uh, something that, that needs to be done, and that's what I have been doing, in fact. Um, how I started my work as an advocate is it's just to beginning with helping people. That's how I started. And even later, I learned that we have some very wonderful phrase or term that call it advocacy. But my work was just the helping. And I started my work as an ad advocate or just helping others from my university life. And um, it started from 1997 specifically because in 1997, one of the very tragic incidents happened in my hometown in East Turkestan. And after that um, incident, uh, many people got killed and many people got arrested, including my own brothers, sisters, and relatives. And at that time, I was studying um, at the university in Australia. And the first time I heard that one of my brother got arrested and one of my nephew got killed. 
And I heard this news when I was sitting in the lecture room just like you. And I got shocked and I didn't know what to do. I was so helpless because um, I didn't know what to do because what has happened in my country is very far away in East Pakistan and I was in Australia. And it's one is distance, another I didn't have any power and I don't ha just completely didn't know what to do. And then I was sitting on the chair just like you and then my lecturer was teaching, lecturing. And then probably she felt that I'm a bit different. And then after the lecture, she came to me and said, look what happened to you. And I said, this is what I heard just now. This is what has happened to my family. But I didn't hear what you said because my mind is not here. And then my lecture, she came to me. She said, wow, this is very tragic. But I really want to talk to you. And then that's how I end up talking to her. Um, she was a French origin. Um, what she has been through is quite similar to what I have been through in her life in the Second World War. And we had very nice talk, and I told her this is what's happening. And then she said, look, I'm working for Amnesty International. We may need to take these cases to there. And then that's how I began to uh, work. And then I said, look, all I want is just to help those people they are very innocent because I know. I know them. And absolutely innocent. And it's it's not fair just to getting arrested for doing nothing, but just getting killed for doing nothing. And that's how I started to begin to work um, to tell people what's happening to Vigorous in East Turkestan and then start with the Amnesty International, and I began to talk to other people and also initiate to organizing our own legal organization. And that's how I end up coming to United States in 2009 with, with the invitation of Mr. Bia Kadir, and I continue to do what I do. And <coughs> definitely, I perfectly understand one of my panelists told me that it is very important that when you tell people what's happening, or who you want to save is about exact who that person is, what happened to that person, the picture, article, writing, or whatever you have. And it is very important, and that's how you, how you make other people to save those innocent people. And um, I'm very lucky and I am very honored that Ms. Kedir invited me to come to the United States and I work formally to advocate my people. And since I started working for the Uyghur hum Human Rights Organization in the United States, and I took different positions, but whatever I do, the only thing in my mind is just to help to helpless because my people were absolutely helpless. Even when I first started about the Uyghurs, what's happening in East Turkestan, my brother, my sister, people didn't know. They said, what's this? What's that place? Can you tell us? Can you show us on the map? What are you talking about? But thank God, right now, everybody knows. Soon I say Uyghur, everybody knows, like every one of you. Well, I am here today because of your interest in knowing more. Maybe you want to do more and help those people, that helpless people. And yeah, this is me, and this is what I do. And with the um, funding from the NED and the help of the United States, the government, now we are formally operating an organization like Vigor Human Rights Project, and we have on other Vigor organizations as well. The Vigor Human Rights Project specifically focuses on research and the documenting, and through this work to advocate. I wish to stop here. Maybe my colleague Nicole will talk more about it. Yeah, Thank I'll you. I'll just briefly pick up on that. Um, so UHRP, it was founded in 2004. So back then, there was it was very difficult to get a lot of um, information, and most people were not aware of who Uyghurs uh, are and and the situation that they're in. Um, and so UHRP was founded with the intention of um, producing research, uh, very reliable, accurate, trustworthy research um, to use for, for advocacy. 
um, because it was very difficult and very little reporting was being done at that time uh, on the situation. Uh, now, of course, because it's turned into a full-fledged full crisis, there's really an unprecedented amount of interest uh, in the issue, uh, which is why it's kind of a good example of um, the emergence of, of a or, and growth of an advocacy campaign. So um, because we're based here in, in DC, it's, it, we do have the opportunity to engage with government officials who might be interested in the specifics of certain cases or want us to bring um, attention to uh, new cases or get accurate information. Um, we do engage uh, with groups like the Tom Lantos Commission uh, and the CECC, which is focused specifically on uh, human rights in China. Um, so we're very gratified that there is an increasing amount of attention being paid to the issue, and um, we look forward to further questions. We're all very grateful to have you here with us as well. Um, this being a panel, I also want to encourage you all to have a discussion amongst yourselves. Um, so going forward, the questions that I ask don't necessarily have to be answered by everyone or in any particular order. Um, and some of you have already touched on this a little bit, but I was wondering if anyone could speak about a specific situation when you approached a fish, an official, um, how you knew what your, the ask was, um, and then how you would um, navigate it, what you would expect as a response, and as well, if you want to touch on any kind of um, tips or timelines for follow-up. Maybe I'll start us off and then warm everyone up. Um, I'm thinking of a particular case when I was advocating on behalf of someone who was in detention in Egypt in my previous capacity. Um, she was an individual who was both Egyptian and American, so she had dual um, residency. So we had that hook, the ability to maybe find out where she was from in the United States, talk to her congressman, and try to get them on board. And she had been in pretrial detention for over two years in excess of even the domestic maximum, which is egregious according to international law, but also egregious in and of itself, that it's violating the country's own laws. And we had, I, we had spoken to her family, of course, gotten all the necessary permissions, and learned just who she was and what she stood for, and, and really tried to spend time talking to her loved ones and her family members in order to really convey that and tell a story. Because at the end of the day, you're not just talking about an abstract concept. You're talking about individuals whose lives are at stake, whose maybe their personal lives have been affected because they're in detention. And I think... Um, when you approach someone, like in our case, we were approaching the person who we identified was her representative in the state that she used to reside when she was here in the United States, the first thing we wanted to do is research. Has this representative spoken on this country before? Has the representative spoken about the thematic area of violations, detention practices, pretrial detention? What has he said? Or what has she said? What bills have they co-sponsored? That way, so when you ask for the meeting and you attend the meeting, you can start off by saying, Congressman, I really appreciated the stance that you took on this case. Or Congressman, that bill that you supported was really important. And you sort of build that, build that initial report, both to show that you've done your research and you know who you're speaking to, but also in order to be yourself prepared and to anticipate what they might say or what they might not say, what challenges you may face when you're advocating on this case. So I think the best piece of advice I can give is just do your research. We have access, we're lucky, because we live in the US and we have a fairly transparent government. It's easy to find out what your congressman, what your representative has been saying or doing on a particular cause. And I think being prepared really builds that, builds that rapport. And then when you're in the meeting, I, I would say, always tell stories. I think numbers are helpful in showing perhaps how big a trend is or, or laws are interesting because they paint the picture and they sort of show how this is systematic, but the person will remember that individual's photo or he'll remember that individual's story or the fact that she used to go to high school in his district and she used to be a participant in this club. So just building those personal details, I think, is extremely important in order to build a narrative. It keeps you yourself grounded and remembering that you're not just doing this for a job or you're not just doing this you're doing this because you actually care and it also that passion and that care really reflects when you're talking to the representative making them much more likely to understand what you're saying and to empathize and really to take action on it it's important to to be mindful of the staff and the staff's time when you meet a representative 
and organize the meeting, you will likely be going through a staffer. And congressional staffers are incredibly busy. Often they manage a lot of portfolios with a lot of issues. And sometimes when I was an intern, I would get calls from someone who would say, I want to speak to the congressman. And the best way is you find out who the staffer is handling, say, foreign affairs. And you make sure to go through them and respect their time and their position. Because if you think staffers are busy, members are even busier. And it's often the member will get it from the staffer. And if you build a rapport with the staffer, the staffer will be more likely to talk you up to the member. Uh, yes, um, in the past, uh, UHRP has um, tried to kind of um, give a personal touch by sending thank you notes, letters. Um, that, that's still a common way to engage with officials by sending letters formally. And then, you know, we'll add maybe a report that we wrote on the issue. Uh, and then um, if you go in person to their office, you can generally ask the front desk if you can, you know, get the information of the staffer who enters international affairs or human rights or that sort of thing. Let me offer a couple of other thoughts. Um, one is I wanted to underscore something that may not have been obvious to you yet, which is the important role of uh, victims and survivors of human rights abuses when they come to the United States and become advocates for other people, whether from their home country or more widely in the world. Um, I don't know if you were talking about Nancy's case. I know, but, um, but the Tahrir Institute, you know, Tahrir is the name of the square in Egypt where the uh, you know, the, uh, uh, the revolution against Mubarak really took place back in 2011. And um, Nancy O'Kale, who was working in Egypt for uh, Freedom House, you know, a very active human rights group, uh, she was one of uh, 42 people who was arrested, non-Egyptian, she's Egyptian, uh, but also British citizen at the time. Uh, she was arrested along with 42 other people who were there trying to help human rights groups and civil society and democracy groups. Uh, the Egyptian government was tired of this international assistance, and so they rounded up all these people, they arrested them, they put them on trial. Some of them got out of the country and were not imprisoned, but Nancy was uh, for a while. And she was uh, uh, a very articulate, uh, proud, un un uncowed uh, person uh, in her uh, imprisonment. And when she got out and came to the United States, uh, she founded this institute in order to be an advocate for democracy in Egypt and across the Arab world. And so um, this institution exists because of one Egyptian woman who decided to take her personal experience and, and make it a larger cause. Just like Tom Lantos, who, as was indicated, you know, was a Holocaust survivor, uh, Rosie mentioned that he got out of Budapest back in the 1940s during World War II. You have to remember what happened in Hungary. I'll tell you just two sentences. The last six months of World War II, after the outcome was clear, the Russian armies were coming in from one side, the British and American and French armies were coming in from the other side, it was obvious that Germany was going to lose the war. At that point, with six months left in the war, the Hungarian authorities started really for the first time rounding up Jews in Hungary and in Budapest and sending them to Auschwitz and other places. 400,000 Hungarian Jews were killed in six months at the end of the war when the Nazis knew they had lost by their Hungarian allies. Th that's how mean-spirited and uh, brutal it was. Uh, Lantos's family got out through the good graces of a Swedish diplomat. Raoul Wallenberg was a, an aristocrat from Sweden, was posted in Budapest at the time, and what, in the strange way that the Nazi system worked, uh, paperwork mattered a lot, right? They were brutal killers, but they also respected paperwork in a bizarre way. So Raoul Wallenberg decided that he was a diplomat. He had a visa machine in his embassy. And he started giving visas to as many Hungarian Jews as he could find uh, so that they could use visas to Sweden to get out of Hungary when the Gestapo was coming for them. So 
uh, Raoul Wallenberg is also a big hero of the human rights movement, and he was a, a Swedish diplomat who just found himself in this moment and did the right thing, and for his trouble, ended up being murdered by the Russians when they came. When the Russians came to liberate Budapest from the Germans, they captured him, put him in the Russian gulag, the Soviet gulag, so that his hero heroism and his advocacy uh, would be forgotten, uh, so that nobody would get any further ideas about what to do under uh, Soviet occupation. So, in, and then of course, um, your story about your family uh, and the stories that you've been able to tell about very specific personal experiences, those are very powerful ways to uh, illustrate larger systemic problems. As May was saying, you know, uh, personal anecdotes and cases of individual people. Even if you don't come from that country and it's not your brother or sister that you're advocating for, the more that you can talk about human experience uh, the more effective the advocacy will be. Great. Thank you so much. Um, Alex, in effort of time, do we want to open it up to questions? So I have several more questions from all of the students, but I want to give an opportunity for everyone to ask questions on their own right now. And if no one has any, then I'll keep going down the list, but I want to open it up. You want me to keep talking? Are these your advocates? They're silent. <laughs> Okay, well, I'm happy to keep questioning. Um, so kind of building as a follow-up to this discussion, I was wondering um, what do you think the difference is in terms of strategies for a case that's particularly a high-profile one, like Hatun al Fasi, or ones that are more um, under the radar, and how do those strategies differ if they do at all? Um, well, um, as in, in terms of our experience, um, right now, there have been some very high profile cases in the past, like Ilham Toti's. Mm -hmm. I believe there are some students coming to discuss his case tomorrow with us. Um, we've engaged with other groups um, to help us raise the profile of the case. Um, but right now, because uh, so many people are being affected by the current crisis, you can um, kind of bring together different people who've had the same experience and then just the weight of numbers can kind of um, create a very strong impact of all these people who've had the same experience. Uh, for example, you know, their their relatives are being persecuted because of their, them being speaking up uh, or and that sort of thing. Um, that can be uh, quite powerful as well. Just wish to add to a bit of to me, Nicole. Um, High profile or ordinary for vigorous case, I think it doesn't make any difference right now because everybody is detained. Imagine over one million vigorous are detained right now in East Turkestan. As Nicole said, yes, before we could, I mean, we were able to just a number in a few very high profile, like for example, start with the Mr. B. Kadir. Uh, she was, uh, she was be able to uh, at the time because of the high profile people's governments and NGOs pressure towards the Chinese government. And the later it happened to Ilham Tohti, it happened to another p person, it happened to all intellectuals, like a 237 intellectuals are detained right now. Like simply like, um, I read this article, uh, it's published on Tony. 5th of February 2019. This person, Hussein Chan, he is a senior translator. And he is um, the director for one of the um, Xinjiang, you know, the, the language and the culture center. And um, I studied together with him in Russia. And I, I just can't imagine that this kind of people also sent to concentration camps. And he's very high profile senior translator. He translates from Chinese to Uyghur, Uyghur to Chinese, and he compiled many dictionaries. And he studied in Russia to learn Russian. And he, his plan was complete. He's just purely academic person. He has no interest whatsoever about politics or anything else. Just to want to compile some kind of amazing dictionary so everybody can benefit. So like this, now we have de detained high-profile people, ordinary people, for example, ordinary 50-something uh, years old, a woman, farmer from 
cells and part of East Turkestan, just the everyone. So for me, like, it's overwhelming. I don't know. Like, I, I, I don't know how we can deal with this one. Even if someone from uh, other country, like in, even in the United States, someone just came today to us, say that, look, this is what has happened to my relative in East Turkestan. Something would happen to that person, another relative as well. That, that's how it's just expanding. So here, it's huge. Honestly, I don't know. Yeah, I mean, we certainly want to, you know, highlight some cases, but um, because we have hundreds of names, um, it's clear that um, pe people from all walks of life are being are being sent to the camps. But it also certainly appears that scholars specifically are being targeted. So we are focusing um, also not only on specific cases, but also just the the huge pattern of the crackdown. Because, because the sheer numbers tell a story also. When cases come across our desk for the Defending Freedoms Project, a higher profile case will be easier to vet because there's more information. So it's when you send this information to a potential advocating office, it's already there. A lower profile case is harder to vet but vetting is possible, and you could be the ones to raise the profile on that case. I would also add one of the most beautiful things about having a high profile case is people know about it, maybe all, people already have feelings about it, but also one of the dangers or challenges is sometimes the people who are less known get forgotten. So one of the things that we've tried to do, you brought up the NGO case in Egypt, for example, in that case, 43 defend and defendants, some of them Egyptian, some of them not, many of them ultimately sentenced in absentia, like Nancy, and their lives were totally uh, up, up, like they faced so much upheaval, they were separated from their families and loved ones. That case got a lot of attention because of the US element and the fact that there were Europeans involved in the case as well in so many popular civil societies, what uh, organizations. What few people knew is that there were also, there's a second phase of the case that's actually targeted against Egyptian civil society or uh, defenders, most of whom are not known to the outside world. So often when, when folks have talked about how important this case is, we also remind them, yes, that case is extremely important, but let's not forget that there's a second phase of the case, people whose names we, might, we may not know, but who we can tell you about, who we can paint these stories for, and remind you that yes, while the US maybe has an interest in this first half of the case, it has every reason to care about the second half of the case, both because of its relationship with Egypt, the fact that it's the second largest recipient of aid, or the variety of other counterterrorism relationships that they have. So using those um, hooks that maybe exist in high profile cases or cases that are already of interest to the advocating entity that you're with and reminding them there's a larger picture. This is happening in a uh, broader context is extremely important. So ground yourself in those personal stories, but also tie it to the larger issue so that the people who are just numbers for some don't get forgotten. So I want to ask one. OK, perfect. Hi, um, just going off of what you were saying, um, you were talking about how could, trying to make a connection between the people that we're uh, trying to advocate for and the people that we're talking to, and you said to do your research. And we can research um, the representative that we're going to talk to, but we don't know if we're going to be faced with them or their staffer. So I guess my question is, um, how would you suggest to make the, these stories like hum as human as possible without knowing who you're going to be talking to? Because um, you don't know if the person that you're going to be talking to is, is a parent or, uh, y you know, if you, you know what I mean. So, yeah. The staffer is there on behalf of the representative. So if you make it meaningful for the representative, the staffer will definitely take note. When I was preparing to speak, I thought of specific questions that advocates could think about, such as the representatives' policy interests, whether they're even domestic policy interests, like say you're a representative who's interested in education policy because you have a lot of schools and colleges and universities in your district, and you could link that to an imprisoned scholar. Think about their policy interests, whether 
you, the advocate, have ties to their district, or the person you're advocating for has ties, such as a large diaspora community from that country in the district. I th really quickly on that, I think also um, the person you're talking to is a human. So irrespective, of, there are some things that we all have in common, right? We all maybe appreciate having loved ones around us. Many of us have had the experience of going to university, so the scholar element maybe is there. You like sort of think of the, of the ways that you would talk to a friend even, and just what, how can you make the story compelling or meaningful to the average audience? I think, and I think your passion comes through. One of the things that I've always heard is advocates, and when you have uh, advocates, their passion comes through. When you are personally tied to the issue, or you care about the issue, and it comes out in the way that you're talking and how dynamic you are and how well your research has been done, that's easy for people to sense because we're all human and we so we're interconnected in that way. So I think just being there and remembering why you're there, remembering why it's so important and grounding yourself in those things really makes you a better advocate. Oftentimes when we're talking about scholars and academics, we think like academia is so scientific and maybe there's less feelings in it, but as advocates, it's actually a beautiful thing to have feelings and to care and to, and to have passion for the issues that you're talking about. And I think the more um, passion that's grounded, of course, in reality and research and facts, um, the more your case is compelling. Great, thank you. I'll uh, ask a follow-up question, and if anyone else wants to, oh, Nelly. Oh, yes, I'd like to ask a question. And I don't want to belabor this point, but I think it's so. Thank you. I think it's so important. Um, so, I've I've asked this um, uh, earlier today of Mr. Waxman, but I think we have such a rich panel here. I'd love to ask this question again. And the question is, what is reasonable and ambitious to ask of the people that you're meeting with to do? So what is their realm of power and what, what is reasonable in that endeavor, right? So uh, can they write a letter? Can they take it to a committee? If so, um, what committees should we be thinking about? And I know partly this has to do with researching um, the person you're, you're meeting with, but I guess I'm not clear as to what, what all of the options are in terms of action for them, and I'd love to know that. Well, the Defending Freedoms Project is always an option where you could ask the member to advocate for this person through the Defending Freedoms Project because it already exists and all the infrastructure exists. And member advocates for DFP prisoners have given, they've given even one minute floor speeches on the birthday of the person, highlighting their case. They've given in part of opening remarks for committees, they've raised the case. They've sent letters. There's all sorts of things, large and small. And you could start with even a one minute speech or the Defending Freedoms Project. Can you explain the Defending Freedoms Project? The Defending Freedoms Project is a project sponsored by the Tom Lantos Human Rights Commission, which allows members of Congress to advocate for prisoners of conscience around the world and we work with different partner organizations that I discussed earlier, and our, partners or, our partner organizations can bring the case, so if you're working with scholars at risk, our scholars at risk contacts will help nominate the person and do all of that. So you're already working within one of our partner organizations, and the organization will nominate the person, and our other partners have to approve and then we put a profile of the person up on our website and where you can learn about their date of arrest, their sentence, their biography, and updates to the case. I think you can also, there's, there's a range of things you can ask for. Maybe something as simple as if they're compelled about a uh, compelled with regards to this case, maybe it's something as simple as a tweet or a, face, a, a post asking them to share about this individual who maybe lived in their district or has some sort of tie to the district or maybe represents a value or a principle that they care about. Maybe it relates to a policy. Uh, maybe it's something a little bit more involved like a floor speech where they're going out and actually making a one minute speech or something of the sort. 
Maybe it's signing on to an existing letter that's circulating on the Hill about a particular individual. Maybe that letter is directed to Secretary Pompeo asking him for the administration to take action on behalf of the case, particularly if he also happens to be an American citizen, which is always a helpful um, hook. Maybe it's that they would be actually sponsoring the letter themselves if they're a little bit more, if they, it's their personal constituent or if they care about the issue more, if they're an advocate of academic freedom, for example. So I think there are a lot of different degrees. Maybe it's hosting a press release with the family or the loved ones. Um, really, I think there's so many opportunities for engagement, which is, also, which is a wonderful thing, right? Because you can always ask for something. And as long as you're doing your best and you're talking to the right people and you're doing your research, hopefully you're, you'll walk out with something, even if it's just that congressman or that staffer having conversations with their other congressman and staffer and encouraging sort of noise about this case or starting to talk about it, starting to percolate. I think um, you have a treasure box of, of different tools at your disposal and making it easy for the staffer that you're talking to always helps. For example, I've been asked in situations where, hey, we're interested in signing on to a letter. Do you think maybe you can draft some points for this letter? Or, hey, what? tell me about where this person was born and, and when they were arrested and, and let me write up a tweet. So providing that information in a succinct way also makes their job easier and makes them much more likely to take the step. So I think it's always helpful to provide resources. I wouldn't say like a 50-page report because chances are they're not going to read it. But those one-pagers, those postcards, those photos, those are the things that really stick and remind them and make their job easy because they're having tens of meetings in a day maybe and they're faced with so many requests. So the more you connect with the person, the more you make it easy, the more you follow up afterwards, say thank you for your time. Here's a soft copy of what I gave you in case it's helpful. Happy to answer any questions. So you basically you're establishing yourself as a resource on the issue, the more likely they're going to come back to you and say, hey, we've thought about it. Congressman wants to do something. This is what it is. Help us in this way. Yeah, I just want to, again, underscore what May is, is saying about uh, do the work that you want them to do. Uh, if you want them to write a letter, give them a draft of a letter. If you want them to put something out on social media, give them a text of what you want them to say. Uh, they may change it or they may not use it, but the, they're more likely to use it if you make it really, really easy for them. Um, yesterday, I got an email from a staffer in the Senate uh, saying that they wanted to do a resolution about Ukraine because the presidential elections are coming up in Ukraine in a few weeks, and obviously there's a lot of human rights issues around the occupation of Crimea and the war in eastern Ukraine, and uh, the, the person I mentioned in particular, Oleg Sentsov, uh, there are other Ukrainians who've been arrested and taken to prison in Russia. And so I said uh, to Ben, I said, uh, and he gave me a draft that somebody in his office had prepared. And it was terrible. It was just sloppy, and it was kind of half written. And uh, I said, uh, uh, you could do better than this, Ben. Uh, and uh, I'll help you write this. I'll write through this and give you a cleaner draft that you know will make some larger points if you agree to put Oleg Sensoff's name in it. So he wrote back and said, OK, we can do that. So. Uh, hopefully we'll see a, a Ukraine resolution in the coming days that will both get some of my advocacy, my organization's interests included in a larger uh, Senate statement about the fraught situation in Ukraine these days. So again, offer to do the work. Don't just say you should do this. Great. Thank you. And um, just listening to how one thread that we've had today is kind of thinking about um, the differences between the different interests that the uh, the U.S. and Canada, for example, would have, uh, whether that's geopolitical or whatever connections that uh, the person who the students are speaking with tomorrow might feel compelled to advocate on behalf of the case. Um, and so I was a question I wanted to pose to the panel is if that connection doesn't seem as visible uh, to the students tomorrow, um, how do we how do we advocate on behalf of um, a scholar or a case in a way that makes it seem that this reality is not, in fact, so far away from where we are in the US and in Canada in particular, um, and that the issues that are happening around the globe aren't, aren't um, unrelated to, to our lives here. <laughs> well, it's a different context, but I want to be inclusive to the well, I, I did see the, one or two of the universities that are included here uh, are Canadian. 
Well, those are the people that will know what a writing is. Not all the, the U.S. students won't know what a writing is, do you? Canadians, can you explain that? Yeah, it's a congressional district in Canada. It's called a riding. I think it dates from the old days when as far as you could ride on a horse was the district that you could represent. So, uh, so yeah, some different terminology in the politics of Canada versus the United States, but fundamentally the concepts are the same in that uh, you have elected representatives who want to get reelected, uh, and to the extent that they recognize that there's a constituency of voters uh, uh, that care that the political leadership take action on these cases, then, uh, I mean, all the same principles apply in Canada as they do here. At the moment, you have a government in Canada that's much more forward-leaning on these kinds of issues than we do here in the United States. Uh, Foreign Minister uh, Christia Freeland of Canada, former journalist, scholar herself. She's written several very good books about Russia and Ukraine. Uh, she's a fluent speaker of Ukrainian and Russian as well as English and French. Um, she's a very unusual foreign minister. She's a human rights advocate and disguised as a foreign minister right now. Uh, and she's been challenging Saudi Arabia on their unjust treatment of so many people, from Jamal Khashoggi to uh, the women that are in prison. Um, so uh, one of the things, depending on your conversations on the Hill or around town this week, is you can say, we're being embarrassed by Canada. They're doing way more than we are in these cases. Uh, try to get a little competition going there. Um, so there's a number of things. But Canada is uh, you know, a core ally of the United States, notwithstanding what you may have heard uh, in the last couple of years from some place, places in Washington. Uh, it shares our values and our interests on this. And ultimately, the question is, for people in Washington, in Congress, and in the State Department, and the White House, is the United States going to be better off if human rights are more widely respected in the world? And that's the case that we always have to be making over and over again, is that yes, the world will be more peaceful, safer, more prosperous to the extent that people are living full lives uh, and able to pursue all their interests and not going to jail unjustly, uh, having large populations like the Uyghurs imprisoned uh, for no good reason, having religions banned. Um, you know, prosperity and social progress and peace uh, are all undermined by repressive practices of so many governments. So taking the emblematic cases that you're dealing with and saying, this is why Saudi Arabia is unstable. This is why Turkey is unstable. This is why China is, d doesn't have the best development model uh, to offer the world. Because this shows that their foundations are fragile and that they're not going to be stable long-term partners of the United States in the way that they claim to be, unless we can persuade them to respect the human rights of their own people. If they don't respect their own people's human rights, then they're not going to respect the agreements they make with us as a country a trade deal or a political treaty or uh, a military alliance. If they're <coughs> if they can't uh, implement their own constitution in their own country, why, do we, why would we expect them to uphold their commitments to us uh, as another country? So there's a number of kinds of arguments you can present in these settings. Thank you. Anyone else want to add to that? I think also building on that, it involves maybe stepping back and asking why would this country or this person be important to the U.S.? Or how does it relate to U.S. interests or Canadian interests? So breaking it down in a simple way. Maybe that country that the individual is from and the U.S. have a military relationship. Maybe they have a counterterrorism relationship. Maybe there are universities in that country, like for, uh, for uh, NYU, say, in this country or X country. Maybe there is a partnership between civil society organizations. Maybe there's tourism interests, like trying to go through and see the different entities that may be invested or may um, find the, the country of interest or of relevance also helps you break down um, the questions that you need to ask and the arguments that you need to ask so that you can go back and say, this country won't be stable if it continues to imprison academic um, academics in this way, or if it continues to pass laws that constrain the ability of individuals to do research, that is going to close the space, which will make it more of a closed country, which will separate it from the rest of the world. How would that affect you? So sort of thinking about these larger geopolitical issues is, imp is an important part of the story. And it's a, 
it's an important exercise, especially when we're maybe, it's so obvious to us why we care about the individual that we're advocating on their behalf, because we care so much, we're trying to help people, we're so invested, maybe we know their family now, we know their loved ones, but it's also important to think about the larger questions and sort of build it into this broader, um, these broader themes that are happening all around the world. It's not just Egypt or Saudi or X that are are facing deteriorations in academic freedoms. It's also other countries, and this is why it's important. This is why it's part of a larger trend, and this is why we should all care. Thank you. Do we want to open it up to one last question? Okay. Does anyone have one last question before we break for lunch? So when I usually talk about um, human rights or just tell other students about the case that we're working on. The first thing that they t mention is how mentally draining that sounds. Um, personally, how do you guys tend to take care of your mental well-being when dealing with such complex issues, not just inside the US, but outside of the United States? Well, I have a large bag of Hershey dark chocolate Hershey Kisses that I'm working through. <laughs> And I also try to take time for things that aren't related to politics or human rights. Like, I spend time with friends, I do yoga. I know that sounds cliche, but making sure you make time to be a person in addition to advocating for people. And I always remind my friends and loved ones in this space that if, you yourself, if you're not taking care of yourself, you can't take care of other people. You're not going to be in the mental health, the emotional health, to be able to do all this work. And maybe sometimes there will be difficult days, but sometimes there will also be happy days. I think the tone of, like, we obviously we're talking about a really heavy and difficult subject, but ask any of us who've had certain successes in our careers, and we can, I'm sure all the panelists can tell you about those success stories, about when we've advocated on behalf of a specific individual, and that individual has gotten out of jail and then called us for the first time. I know that was one of the most beautiful moments in my life, when a teenager who I was working with in Egypt, on behalf, um, on behalf of his case, he had been tortured for wearing a t-shirt that said, a nation without torture, actually, and had been thrown into pretrial detention for two and a half years. And I had never met this individual, was working on his case. And then um, fast forward uh, a few months later, and he's ultimately ordered release from pretrial detention. And I get a voice note from his brother, who I was used to talking to because he provided me updates. And I press play on the voice note, and for the first time, it wasn't his brother, it wasn't the voice of the brother, it was actually the voice of the detainee who had been released. So for me, that success is something to carry me through. So you, maybe sometimes you'll have those big, happy, beautiful successes where you felt like you contributed to the ability of one person to rebuild their life together. Maybe it'll be something that's less visible, like, hey, we had a great meeting on the Hill. We were able to convince that congressman to tweet, or we were able to get 20 congressmen to sign on to a letter. So also being positive and looking for successes in the work that you do is really important to carry you through. Because if you think of just the large successes or think of um, success in a very narrowly defined way, you wouldn't be able to sustain the work that you do. So maintaining positivity, I think, is also important. Also, you should think in terms of you know, this uh, success failure rate. You should think in baseball terms, right? If, uh, if you get a hit one out of three times, you go to the Hall of Fame, right? 333 batting average is about as good as it's ever going to get. That means you lose two out of three times, right? You strike out or you get you ground out. So in the human rights work, we have to think in those terms, that we're not going to hit a home run every time, but we may get some singles, and we may get a batting average of 250 or 300, and that's really good. Uh, and so it's important to keep focused that way. And the other thing is, why are you going to college? Why, why are you reading about the world? Why do you want to travel? You want to make a difference. You want to do something that matters with your lives. This is it. This is invigorating. Uh, it's important. It's not always going to be uh, easy to succeed, but it matters that you do this, and it matters that you try uh, because you will succeed. Um, 
to me, I always feel that um, nothing is forever. You know, no matter whether it's how tragic it is, how bad it is, how bad the situation may get, but nothing is forever. Everything has a stop, no matter what. That always keeps me going, and also um, the faith is very important. It's it is very. Uh, sometimes I just take uh, times off. I spend time with my family. Like it's great to talk to with little kids. Um, for me, it's just fantastic. You know, hear what they say. It's they make things so simple. Mm -hmm. Oh, it's okay. You can just do like this. You know, it's just kids talk. It's um, it's very rewarding. Like I always talk with my middle school kid. He's very funny. So <laughs> uh, that that's also something different. I completely take out from the work and then look at something different. Listen to music. Or just to read religious books is very helpful too. And yeah, I mean. The one very important thing is no matter what, we don't do something just for becoming successful, becoming famous, or becoming something visible. What I do, what we do is to make other people's lives better, you know, make a bit of difference. So that will keep me going. I think that's a great ending note. Uh, would everyone like to just uh, thank our uh, panelists again? <laughs>